you are listening to master's decoded podcast series i'm your host and the chief decoder anis merchant through this podcast i bring in guests who are successful in a different walk of life to decode and map out their careers and journeys with the hope that we gain all our learnings the world around us is changing exponentially and how the impact of artificial intelligence technology and other socio-economic factors have either influenced or enhanced my guest careers in today's episode i invited dr raul rodriguez dr raul rodriguez is the dean of the school of business at waxin university he holds a phd in artificial intelligence and robotic process automation application in human resources prior to this Dr. Rawl was a CEO and HR manager at Ironis Research Institute. A research institute specialized in the field of neuromarketing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, cybersecurity, market research, behavioral science, social research methods and behavioral engineering. He is a registered expert in artificial intelligence, intelligent systems and multi-agent systems at the European Commission. and nominee for the Forbes 30 under 30 in 2020 Europe. Alongside he has a regular keynote speaker and panel moderator at various national and international conferences or summits. In his career he has co-authored two reference books and has more than 70 publications to his credit. Apart from this he's a journal reviewer and associate editor in various publications such as IEEE. Without much further ado, let me get on with it. Hi Rao, welcome to Masters Decoded podcast series. Thanks for taking time out. Hi, thank you so much for the invitation. Not a problem. Rao, when I was looking at your background on LinkedIn, something which really intrigued me and I wanted to have this question out of the gate first is uh, you're not from India as I understand it right, uh, but you've done your undergrad from Mumbai. you did your post graduation from spain and you did your doctorate from mexico uh, share share some light on that and i'm sure people listening and when they hear this they will say okay we would love to know more about him well uh, it was actually an interesting experience as you look at it i i am a member now of rotary international it's an organization working for the well-being of humanity as a whole is not an ngo but is more oriented towards uh, that uh, human welfare so back uh, in spain the year years ago now i used to be a member of something called rotaract which is the jude wing of it and there is something in rotary called uh, rotary international exchange programs so you get the chance to go for six months one year to a foreign country as is obvious being from spain i will not choose europe because there will not be any sort of cultural shock So in fact my options were india taiwan and south africa and well i chose india uh, as per discussing it here and there with the family and seeing which country would be more appealing i came by spent my year here and then i so a fascinating college which i actually connected a lot with because they had partnerships with universities in spain called saint xavier's college pretty known in india with branches in bombay and and kolkata so as i was in mumbai i took it over over there um well that was the initial approach of it and the reason if you look at the, my profile i'm not the um standard uh, btech mtech kind of guy uh, not follow on that perspective simply because i understood from the very beginning if you want to fall into any sort of technology especially what is known as ai you need to comprehend first human intelligence to do that you need to obviously know slightly about psychology and sociology that's what drives us in any field irrespective of the degree so i felt that was the core of everything and they moved into the technological side i went back to spain and well, that's how i landed into the, my my postgrad over there and my phd in mexico is very simple uh, mexico is a very close uh, close country to spain in terms of language and culture is not so extensively different it's not like india and spain so Mm-hmm. there are partnerships as well between spanish universities and mexican universities so again through that i landed over there uh, i came back to india simply because well uh, my wife is indian so i got married with an indian uh, i'm a harashtrian actually from mumbai nice. itself 
So as you know, my, my years in India, in the, my undergrad paid off in that regard. And well, then I stay here permanently, yeah. You never know how destiny takes you in different places and how life unfolds in front of you. And I think that's yeah. something which has happened to you as well, uh, where you wanted to take an international experience and now which got to build your life and have a life partner, which is pretty impressive. Now, I believe you work as a dean in a university in India, in Hyderabad. Share a little bit about universities all about and why Hyderabad and why this university? Before shifting to Hyderabad, as I was in Mumbai already uh, till last year, when I got the opportunity to join uh, Waxing University, simply was because uh, the discussions I had with the former dean, now vice chancellor, and the chairman as well, was that this university was, first of all, internationally oriented, highly internationally oriented, created uh, around six years ago now, with the aim of becoming a financial times rank institution, that which is, well, the most prestigious ranking worldwide, where all the Harvard, Stanford, Oxford of the world are ranked. And that was the aim initially. They did not intend to compete with IIMs, IITs in the Indian context, nor ISB. They wanted to play on an international market. So, well, especially that, um, because I come from a tech background and they developed a very interesting program, which is an MBA with specialization in AI. I first I, I joined running that program and then I escalated and climbed the ladder into the dean position to, to drive the institution par particularly into that into the international direction but, and obviously to move into an international approach you need somebody from an international background uh, it's pretty common sense hence mm, to approach the west the so-called west US Canada Europe you need obviously someone who knows the culture and speaks the language and can deal with the people accordingly so that was the, the orientation of the institution, it still is, and that's the direction we're following. Now, when I, and the, the, there are a couple of things which you just said, uh, which are very interesting, and I would love to double click. So the one thing which you spoke about when you were thinking about your career and when you were thinking about your graduation and post-graduation, you said, before I choose technology, I need to understand humans. And mm -hmm. psychology is the fundamental piece which allows you to teach. Uh, about how humans think and how humans behave. Uh, and But I see you did your PhD in human resource in AI. So talk a little bit about, you know, because there's a lot of, you know, before we started this, we started talking a little bit about AI. There's so much of about AI, right? Everybody is saying it's like a blue pill. It's, it's almost like that vaccine which is going to cure the world, mm -hmm. right? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, if, this pandemic was not there. I think AI yeah, would have been that uh, godly figure which would change the world. Uh, but at the end of the day, we are humans, right? We are not technology. So shed, mm -hmm. shed a little bit light about that. What's your perspective about AI and humans? Uh, there is a big misconception about AI everywhere. For starters, there is nothing called AI at the moment. What we, what we wanted to know as artificial general intelligence, we still have not reached that, that kind of background. So we are right now running on machine learning and deep learning up to a certain extent. Uh, I have taken a bit of a top notch ahead. I am developing or researching upon quantum computing, which is a bit out of the picture as well. But uh, as you look at any social media platform, the news, you switch on the TV, everything is AI is everywhere. Startups are all about AI. But when you actually speak to them and test their services, they don't know the ABDC of AI. So that is a big problem. All these new data scientists who just copy paste codes from GitHub and Kaggle, and they just run them on the programming language they're using, and they don't know anything about maths, stats, uh, nothing about algebra. They have no clue about anything at all. So how can you perform something? It's, it's, it's just performing mathematics without numbers. So you cannot proceed in that direction. And something that people have not understood yet is that AI, uh, especially AI, it's all initially originated from psychology. It does not come from a technological perspective. It comes from a psychological perspective. That's why we have terms like learning, from machine learning, intelligence, reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is a psychological experiment conducted in the 1950s. So there is nothing new about it. AI has not discovered it. They're just withdrawing these areas from liberal arts. 
people don't comprehend this. They are thinking that this is uh, something created by us, by the so-called pioneers of AI. It has been there long ago in the psychological field. And we, we all experience it. As a kid, you learn what is right, what is wrong by reinforcement. Either you get punished or you get rewarded. And accordingly, you develop your routines and your habits in life. The same an AI algorithm or a machine learning algorithm will do it. It will learn by what the input you provide. So this is a big misconception people don't understand. And at the end of the day, science is able to question things and discover new things because they have some psychological and philosophical background to it. Thanks to all these Plato, Aristotle, all the Roman philosophers, even all the modern philosophers like Nietzsche in Germany prior to the Nazi period, because of them, we are able to wonder. And that sense of wonder and that sense of questioning exists. That's why we're able to think, what if I apply AI in healthcare? What, what will happen now? What if? We have seen AI is not able to discover a, a vaccine for COVID-19 because, well, there are certain chemical and biological procedures involved, which is not yet meeting those standards. So we need the human factor, hence the questioning and rational and obviously the cognitive abilities. But you also spoke about that you're running an MBA in AI. Yeah. Right? Program at Watson University. Uh, so there will be a conflict in you yourself going on, right? Where you are preaching AI, right? Uh, through your college, but you also have done your, spent good amount of years doing research on psychology and understanding human behaviors, right? So, and, and you rightly said, you know, AI is just a technology which is trying to enhance liberal arts uh, and that knowledge of liberal arts and bring it up front. And we are trying to automate it in many ways also uh, using the power of technology. So mm -hmm. is there, do you see that conflict often between in your mind as well, uh, liberal arts and AI? Oh, that I, I kind of, of have built the bridge for that in the MBA especially. I don't know MBA is all management, but if you add some tech background to it, in this sense, well, the students learn all the standard managerial subjects, which we all know. Additionally, the specialization falls on things like neural networks, learning Python and Julia, learning machine learning projects, hands-on projects that they can do. So they sort of, they're being trained to become this kind of data scientist, modern data scientist with the soft as well as the technical skills involved. I have included subjects such as cognitive neuroscience and cognitive psychology as part of the curriculum. So that also falls up. Even students have always wondered not from a questionable perspective, but from a, um, let's say, uh, they find it interesting that somebody, normally when you find somebody who has done a psychology or any sort of liberal arts background, they fall in BA, MA, PhD, or BA, MA industry. Uh, they just never BA, MSc in big data or, or any sort of technical background and PhD in a complete technical field, which only people with BTEC access. So this kind of backgrounds is what has given, I feel, giving me that edge to understand a bit more about people. I am not so much focused about what can technology do for us, but more about what can we do with ourselves and how can technology enable us. And technology is not here to replace us, it's here to enable us to perform a bit better or somehow a bit more accurately. Beyond that, I don't think we should have big hopes about all these Terminator-like realities of AI will come with induced robotics and kill us all. That is, that is very Elon Musk kind. And though it might be attractive and interesting to see in real life, we all know that having an Iron Man flo flying around the skies is very unlikely to happen for various physical and chemical reasons. So considering all this, yeah, conflicts appear, but obviously at the end of the day, you have to you know, unlearn, relearn, and then learn again. So it's a process which either you're in academia or in industry, you need to follow. So uh, you started your career uh, in HR, where you focus and you became a uh, head of HR for a company and, uh, and you focused on that. Uh, and then getting into academia, was academia and is academia a career choice or is it something which you are still evaluating because you are currently in this role? And uh, I would love to know a little bit more about IRONS, uh, if I pronounce it right, which is an institute yeah. uh, of applied neuroscience. It sounds fascinating. Uh, about, I'm sure there will be some 
very highly confidential research, which will also be happening in that institute. But let's talk a little bit about your career choice. You were in HR. You did your doctorate in HR. Um, you were you were in a respectable and a CEO, almost like a co-CEO in Irons. And now career in in academia. Uh, how do the two align? So uh, this company was actually uh, developed and founded by three my three friends among them me and two more an Indian and a German guy. The Indian guy is now a professor at Oxford Brookes University. The other guy works at uh, Daimler, the Mercedes manufacturer in, in Stuttgart in Germany. Um, the Spanish guy landed into India. So that is the kind of distribution we we followed. Uh, the company we established it because three of us had some sort of interest in one psychology and secondly some sort of research approach at that point of time we were not very clear how to take it forward so we mm, genetically opened it in a very broad spectrum and as i was in the industry and i well i had interest in the human science HR, and then moving on into obviously masters and phd on a technical completely technical side i mean even the phd thesis my phd thesis was 12,000 lines of code so it was all code. There was nothing, you know, theoretical concepts to it. So all those applications which I, I learned to develop in my PhD, I learned it from the time as a as an you know, HR practitioner, seeing how things and systems and methods could be improved with AI, or maybe made more easy way and reduce that load of work. As I got into industry, I spent there around nearly four years, four or five years. I really enjoyed the time, but at the same time, I was missing that. Uh, teaching perspective or you no know, interchanging inter knowledge because people believe academia is all about you come you come to the class you blabber some things and people take notes and you walk out you, you assess them and that's over it's it's a process of walking in the class and start interchanging knowledge i learn from the students as much as the students might learn from me so there's a it's a dual process so i used to miss that i used to still conduct visiting lectures in various institutes but then i thought why not uh, give it a shot and go full time and you know, develop a career to fit. So it's a career choice. It's not a career I am assessing. I landed intentionally here. Uh, also, because, well, when I was with my, my former partner now, friend, uh, his name is Indranil in Chatterjee, Bengali. Uh, he, when he, I was in Oxford with him, uh, in Oxford Brookes University, conducted some symposiums here and there. I saw the life of academia from a different perspective. So I wanted to bring that into the Indian context as well, since I was here. And that was pretty much the, the path. It was a path with a lot of rocks and you know, stamping upon every now and then. But at the end of the day, if you don't have such things in life, then what is, what, how, how do you make it entertaining? How do you make it interesting? If it's a smooth highway, there is no fanciness in it. If there is no risk, there is nothing good. I, I see that you are a big reviewer of content across different publications. Uh, yeah. And you review a lot of content which is coming out, which is going to be fascinating for you as well on thought process. Like you are almost reviewing works of wanderers as you gave that name. Uh, and, you know, these wanderers are coming up with thesis, perspectives of life and applications of technology or applications of science, whether it is liberal science also. Uh, you know, can you talk about one or two which really fascinated you on the thinking process of individuals? Yeah, uh, well, I review for various journals, either management as well as engineering journals. Engineering journals, though interesting, uh, they become, for the general public, they become very technical, so they will not, people will not really find it interesting, shocking at first hand. If you look at management with some technical approach oriented to it, I've worked on a couple of them with the students, uh, current as well as uh, upcoming students at Vox and one of them had an idea. He told me very clearly, uh, my mother has uh, a type of, well, a stage of breast cancer, so she's suffering from that. I said, fine, so what would you like to do? Do you like to develop some sort of research? Because this is the, in this is the uh, innate human emotion. If something goes wrong, I want to research upon it to discover what happens. So the person had, of course, background into technology and wanted to research upon it with the eye. So we started collecting data from different x-rays or breast cancer, different stages, this and that. And we put it together, we ran different methods, and the paper got developed, I reviewed it. Uh, it seemed fair enough, and I told the person, why don't we develop um, an app on this? We should develop actual apps, people can use it, and we can prevent more people 
from well uh, developing this kind of stage uh, in advance so the doctors can develop their uh, masters in this way and um, well, that's is under process at the moment in development and you can just imagine that uh, this kind of idea that you come across of regular people we are not talking about uh, directors of MNCs or directors of research, we are talking about students, we are talking about maybe PhD grads or maybe master students who are just pursuing some sort of dream or aspiration in base of their career, in base of their family needs. That are, those are the most interesting uh, interesting papers that you can come across. There are many more. There are, just, there are guys who don't know foreign languages but would like to know, so they created translators with 54 languages, including Telugu, including Marathi, all these languages beyond the Google Translator kind of platform. Google Translator is very inaccurate, I can vouch. Uh, it doesn't work very well, especially Spanish to English. So uh, on that way, I ask them, do extensive research, try to improve their product, and then you can see something else. So that innate interest that humans may have in something or the other, not for the sake of publishing papers, that is a different story, but just for the sake of discovering things is what really triggers my interest. I, don't, I do not review papers which are standard just for the sake of uh, publication count, which many people do. I will only like to review papers that actually interest me, because if I invest, let's say, an hour of my time, I could be doing something else with that hour of my time. Yeah. And I have discovered from my personal experience as well, uh, even my, my uncle had uh, developed brain cancer, last stage. So I have discovered and noticed in life, especially during COVID-19 also, that time is limited. So if you spend it to do something, make sure that interest you for one, and secondly, it's worth it. If it's not, there is no point whatsoever, irrespective of the output, because you will be just consuming it and wasting it instead of investing it. So that is how I really approach uh, journal reviews, uh, the journal or article reviews, be it for magazine or uh, journal publications. Have you been preaching to your students in the college as well uh, to go ahead and think about research and do some deep level research which are unique rather than just to your point about publications for the heck of it yeah i have i have actually told them focus on sectors that you feel you will be interested on and secondly sectors that will have certain outputs in the future uh do not go into sectors which have already been researched upon extensively because then it has nothing to it so most of them have taken some sort of uh, healthcare related area because as you know healthcare is all we have especially we have come to know that in the last four or five months. And on the other hand, many of them have interest in banking and finance related areas. So they go into credit credit loan predictions or defaulted predictions kind of parameters and algorithms. So these are the areas they're liking a lot in getting into. One of them likes football. So I got them across that as well, how to predict market transfers, which obviously if it clicks and is accurately done, it can be a boom in the market and in the football industry. But especially healthcare, that is the thing, the most demanded one from pneumonia to cancer to uh, we have, I have developed one with a student on 3D organ, organ printing. So to print 3D organs using deep learning and using quantum computing as well. The aim is to basically eliminate waiting lists. Like you come to the hospital, of course, as a patient, this guy has a heart problem, needs a new heart, no problem. Give me 10 minutes, you have it. And the hair will not be rejected. It will be perfectly accurate with the stem cells, the blood type, everything will match. There's no scope for rejection. Of course, if that clicks, nothing better. We will be saving lives, which is, I feel, the most important thing you can do with research. Beyond that, there is nothing else that matters. Today, when you look at your quality of students, uh, which are coming in, and, uh, you know, it, and it's global impact, right? Everybody wants to do a master's program. Uh, and, uh, at least the time when I graduated, you know, people who went for masters or people who did their masters or did their doctorate, that quality clearly distinguished. But today, education has also become a money-making business. I will say it here. Uh, don't mind it if I'm saying it. No, and no, no. The no secret. The, yeah, the quality is also a suspect of the master's program. Uh, of many students. So how do you strike that balance with your students whom you are intaking as well as what you're imparting to students? Before they join the institution, we have an interview with them, uh, with the faculty members as well as me, uh, individual interviews. So we do invest a lot of time in that, but we invest the time because uh, we only want people who will be committed. We might not be looking for the best. Looking for the best is like pointing at blanks. 
but I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at whether the person might not be the best, but wishes to become and has a skill set or at least has the passion to do so. People who just come for the sake of getting a printout, because at the end of the day, that's what a degree will be, is a printout paper uh, with a meaning to it. And that is not the aim of being any master's. Forget the master's, it's not the aim of being any sort of university or education in the first place. University was created to wonder. I mean, if now Plato, Aristotle, Socrates wake up and they look at the current education scenario, they'll die back again. But because they'll, they'll feel like whatever we created, whatever aim of wonder and whatever aim of discovery and research we created is going for us. Overall, worldwide, I'm talking about. Uh, irrespective of the institution, Ivy League or non-Ivy League. I mean, we saw, I think it was last year or, in, or last to last year, there was a big scam in the Ivy League institutions because yep. of that admissions, pay-ups, and all these things. So uh, imagine if it happens in such institutions that have to keep certain repute because, well, they are globally acclaimed for more than 200 years. Imagine what can happen in tier two, three, and three, three and four institutions. That is a problem, which lies in the education system as, as a rooting in the education system. And that's because money has driven education. Education was not supposed to be driven by money because something which I keep repeating to corporates when they come, especially in India, there's the concept of placements, as you know, uh, which is not there in Europe at all, but it was alien to me earlier. Now I'm pretty much used to it. But I tell always corporates, uh, education system, academia, it is not industry. We are not here to make money. Ideally, that is not the aim. So we are here to train people to become better. That's pretty much it. And wandering and research. Beyond that, we are not here to train you to get a 8, 10, 15, 20 lakhs package. That is not the aim. The aim is not to become rich over time with the salary. Hmm. People have to comprehend this, irrespective of a degree, be it an MBA. In fact, MBA actually was created to create entrepreneurs, not to get yeah. people placed. I mean, the aim of an MBA is to do an MBA and then create your own company. That was the sole aim of an MBA in the first place. Now the MBA has turned into getting a job in an MNC and, and settled there for life. That is a problem. As you go through this entire exercise of the university, and, and you so aptly said that the MBA programs today have become a placement process. Uh, and mainly because companies want entrepreneur like mindsets within the organization and within the company they work because they believe that they want to develop and they want people who can take things ahead. But everybody is also not built for an entrepreneur or being an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, uh, so yeah. that's a that's a great thing. But one thing which you spoke about and I it's been going on in my mind and, uh, you know, you said that this was alien to me. And when you came to India for your undergrad from Spain, I'm sure it would have been a big culture shock. Oh, uh, yeah. A lot of things, right? <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about that, right? And you have now your better half who's an Indian and from Maharashtra, India, right? So let's talk about that phase where you landed up in Mumbai for your undergrad. How did that go the first six months, one year? How was that entire process? Uh, I, I'll, I'll just start narrating it very quickly when the first time I landed into India. So I remember very neatly. I landed on the 23rd of July. Uh, so it was the 23rd of July. Yeah, plain monsoon, Bombay, uh, extremely humid, like 87, 89% humidity, insanely crazy. I remember I was coming from, from Munich. I traveled Madrid to Munich, Munich to Mumbai by a Lufthansa. And when I, land, I was landing, the captain had the audacity to go and say something like, Welcome to Mumbai, the temperature is 40 degrees and the humidity is 89%. Like, okay, guys, when do we you know, turn around and go back? Because the moment <laughs> I got out of the plane, at the time, uh, Mumbai airport, the new one was not there, it was the old one, the, what is now the domestic one. So at that time, imagine that domestic terminal was not as developed. And when I landed, I, I first struck me that hit in the face, humid, uh, tropical kind of weather. So like, oh Lord, where, where we have come? What, what is this place? And one thing that struck me a lot is that, because being from Spain, there is something uh, biologically that people that tend to be very tall in general terms. Either, if we talk about centimeters, it will be around 190, or around six feet, six plus. So when I landed here and I saw people, 
I honestly feel a strike difference because people were like way beyond that uh, centimeter height. And of course, as you come in, especially from Germany, it suddenly strikes you over here. That was my first experience. I mean, the first week was a bit uh, lost and when I, even the food was, well, the food is another story altogether. Food is like, was completely insane. And maybe I, I was wondering, why do you guys eat to suffer? I mean, you're eating just to suffer, to cry. Do you really want to suffer? <laughs> Just to because give me all these. Yeah, oh, yes. the they used to give me all this. Uh, they call this uh, misel misel pao. I think it's pronounced oh, yes. correctly. Oof, and that was that was like like almost poison to me at the time. I mean, uh, they they give it to me. Just imagine you can with your taste buds accommodated to the bland so-called bland food, and then you land here and they drop uh, one kg of masala in that food, and suddenly you feel like, oh, what is this? Of course. You get used to it over time. I travel all over the country over the years, especially in the first year I travel a lot to Himalayas and Punjab, Delhi, Kolkata, Goa, of course. Goa is like the, the two go destination for foreigners here. And I got to see a lot of things. I understood cultures are it's not like in Europe. Europe, even you go to any country, most of the land you find the same. But here every every state is like another country altogether. Uh, they have completely different language, sometimes religion, even practices, let alone everything else. And that was very striking, of course. And obviously, my first festival, which is something very fascinating in India, is that in India you have holidays almost every alternate day. Uh, so every every alternate day there is some public holiday or the other. So at that time, it was this uh, Gampati festival, my, my first Gampati oh, festival. Yeah. yeah, so imagine that was back then and with the crowds. So somebody had the, the interesting idea to take me to Pune uh, okay. to, to see that uh, walk or whatever it was called, some march. And again, as being the white guy in the middle of full Indian crowd, I became like the center of attraction and center of attention. Why is the, the white guy in the middle of a Gampati festival the two hanging a, um, the, the idol on me? Uh, so okay. All these experiences is what shapes you, I feel. Then, as the years, years pass by, everything gets normalized, of course. Sure. So, now let's talk a little bit about further on this, uh, that first three months. How did you adjust? Like, what practices did you use? Because language was also one of the big things. Now, India, definitely a lot of English-speaking uh, people. But you come from Spain. Spain. Spanish is the first language and everything else, right? So, English was a second language. And English is a second language in India. It's not the first language, uh, depending upon which state you go to. Naturally, if you go to a state like Kerala, you would see that as the first language in many yes. parts. But coming from a country which was English was a second language and going to a country where English is a second language, how did you adjust? Uh, the problem is in Spain, people don't speak English uh, normally. They, and the speak is extremely broken. But as I spent some time in the UK and Germany, the English got quite polished on that on their accent. So when I came to India, it was uh, again readjusting process to the to the accent here. At first, barely anyone will be able to understand me on what I'm saying or how I'm saying it. Certain terms and talking about certain English technical terms like let's say flabbergasting, like people didn't know what it means. So I was a bit okay. Let me let me just you know escalate it down a little. In certain regions I'm talking about, if you go to South Bombay, of course, people used to understand me pretty well. So language was a big barrier uh, on that regard. Other than that, I feel the, the overall the overall culture, maybe the population, though, the population used to kill me that uh, so many people everywhere all the time is it used to be so much, so absorbing, so exhausting. Because in, I mean, where I come from, in, uh, maybe at 8 p.m., 9 p.m., you'll rarely find anybody in the street. And yeah. here, any time of the day, you find somebody. And he was striking at first. And the traffic, I mean, especially living in Mumbai, the traffic was, oof, no comments. Two kilometers takes me two hours in the middle of monsoon. It was something astonishing to me. When I could go take from two days. Madrid. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's take two crazy. days in trains, right? Yeah, in oh, train, 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 you train, take train. two days. I forgot talking about the trains. That's also, I, when I went the first time in the trains, uh, I traveled quite often to by train, especially from to CST and because St. Saviors was there, right? So yep. to CST and all these areas, even Western Line as well. And the first time 
two occasions I can remember. First time, first occasion is that I got into a ladies' compartment by mistake because I did not know there was a ladies' compartment. I mean, where in any place I've seen so far, there is no differentiation between genders. So when I came, I just got into the first compartment and I saw empty. But then I came inside, I realized, right, something is off here. So many women, but I don't see any men. I, something struck me at first, and I'm like, okay, something is really off. Then a woman came to me and spoke in English and said, you can get down or I call the police. I said, okay, very nice, so welcome me here. And I just kept going until the next train station got down and then changed. But just imagine that a foreigner, which is, I mean, it's clearly a foreigner because you can just foresee by the look, gets into a little compartment by mistake, uh, and they're already thinking about calling the cops. So <laughs> that's the, the first striking image of it. And second one was I took a, a train, a fast train from uh, was Charles, Gate, Charles Gate to Birar. By mistake, I wanted to get down in Anderi. Oh, Lord. Again, another, another, bad choice. another speech. Yes, yes, yes. Tremendous bad choice. I got pulled out, pulled in for everyone, by everybody. I was surprised I still kept my clothes when I got down the train. So all these things are experiences in life, which as far as I'm interesting, it really helped me a lot seeing how other countries operate with such a population. The Indian population is huge, even today is enormous. I mean, uh, too much manpower, but the problem is where can you utilize them? Because most of them live in rural areas. So it's a bit challenging, very, very big challenge. Perfect problem for AI to solve, right? There are so many problem statements, uh, whether it is, <laughs> whether it is ensuring that men do not get into wrong compartments of trains or controlling the crowd or you know the food like when you look at missile power something should tell you don't eat it or it has these <laughs> levels of spices right so there are so many problems which you can actually solve with AI. Uh, so it can be tried yes but let's see at the end of the day AI is not magic as we spoke about and yeah. landing into such things and some you love the craziness and that's why it caught you back to India. <laughs> you married somebody who's from the state who actually makes missile powers, who loves missile powers. I'm sure your wife loves that because it's a staple food of the state. Uh, yes. Apart from Vada Pao, which I'm sure you've tasted that as well. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, how did, uh, you know, coming now, okay, that was Mumbai to you. Now Hyderabad is altogether a different level of place. Uh, and uh, I have been to that place many times, uh, and Hyderabad is completely different. The language, the accent, uh, I'm sure you can find that mark difference. Even if they speak Hindi, it's a big difference of how they say things also. They have that peculiarity. So, uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, and the, the culture is very different, as they call it, it's the Nawabi culture uh, also in Hyderabad. Uh, so talk a little bit about Hyderabad. I'm sure listening from you would be, you know, you would be finding these things which will be common to common people's eyes, but you will find that stark difference between Mumbai and Hyderabad. What that strikes me more is how come the culture changed so much when you are basically 10 hours drive from Bombay by a highway. Uh, I mean, it's not like a big difference. You can go from Madrid to Barcelona in half the time. And and the same, more distance actually. And then here it changes drastically. And not just the food, food still somewhat close by, not so radically different, especially when well, the biryani is slightly better, that I can say. Beyond that, uh, language, of course, with Telugu and all is not possible. Either they speak English or forget it. Hindi also is not something very common in general terms over here. Accent, somewhat, if they speak English, they can follow. Other than that, it becomes complex. What I found very, uh, very um, striking, just like in Bombay, but here is on a different level. In Bombay, you have, for example, uh, Mambani's building, if I recall the names in Antilla, if I recall yep. well. And you have the slums right in front. So it's like very striking difference. But then you come to Hyderabad, and you're maybe in areas such as um, Jubilee Hills or Banjara, which is like the uh, Kolaba kind of Bombay. And these kind of rich areas and well developed. and one kilometer away, like literally one kilometer, you have a complete different area, the old Hyderabad, which is drastically different. It's like seeing Berlin when the, when the wall was there. 
the east and the west, exactly like that. So it really strikes me a lot how some people chose to live in conglomerates, you know, such as here it's more of a religion. So the Christians, the Hindus, the Muslims, so they live in a particular area and they all behave as they will wish to behave and they don't let anybody else come in and this is how we behave, so you have to take it. So they, they really establish these differences, differential marks in the, in the groups, which is something which called my attention a lot. Like, why don't you live in cohesion, you know? Or you can live all together in a similar kind of um, lifestyle, which is no harm to anybody. Instead, they choose to live in such areas where some of the, most of the times are not hygienic, hygienic even because of the population and animals roaming around all the time and dust everywhere. Something which really intrigues me. How can they not realize this fact? Or whether they realize it, they don't care. I don't know which one it is. It's probably both. It must be a mixture. Yeah, it must be a mixture. So now with COVID, I'm sure your college is impacted. Students are not probably coming back to the campus or students are the new batch at least. The I don't know about the previous year batch. How have you been able to adjust and leverage technology to still keep the college on or to still keep the university on? Uh, not right now, everything falls online, but well, hopefully the college will reopen somewhere in the month of November, October, but well, probably November because of the government guidelines. And that too, even if we reopen, uh, maintaining social distance and all these uh, health measures will be a bit complex considering we're having 100 students in one class sometimes 70, 80, in the range of 70 to 100. So ensuring mass, that is fine, can be done, but ensuring social distance, as you can imagine, will be a challenge, especially in the canteen. We have the gymnasium as well. How can you ensure social distance in the gym? I mean, there are things which mm, are just not viable. So yeah. um, legally, yeah. and of course, health-wise, we have to follow certain guidelines provided by the government. If you ask me on a more personal note, I will follow a system like the Netherlands is following. The Netherlands is just assumed and told the citizens that, guys, this is going to be there. Now, you can wear a mask, or you may not wear it, that's up to you, but you will have to learn to live with COVID uh, until the vaccine comes. Till then, we are not going to lock down, we are not going to stop businesses, we are not going to do anything as such. It's up to you. You want to take measures? Good. You don't want to take it? Your life. So, in this way, uh, some of you are giving the power and the responsibility to the people. If you lock down like it happened here, it's a mess because people get laid off, businesses shut down. Of course, the GDP drops like anything. Education system, people can't take classes online, but students don't like, don't like the classes online because there's no engagement. Uh, I mean, the engagement happens only when someone is speaking. And from the professor side also, we don't, we might, or we may not get to get every, everyone's video. So, and they might not reply all the same time. So it's like we are talking to ourselves until we only see names on the screen. And we may see the, the camera on. Other than that, there is no human factor to it. So that is a, something very lacking right now. And I don't think it will be long-term sustainability for it. And the government knows it. That's why they have started giving some hint, hints of will open in October, November. But they have to open. Because Indian colleges are designed to be uh, in person. They are not designed to be online. Why well, is this a wastage of resources? Just imagine such a big campuses, like and all these big institutions' campuses. Yeah. What are they going to do with infrastructure? They want just to keep it for decoration. I mean, there has to be some use to it. And that use will happen to coming back to normal. It will be the new normality. How will it be? When will it happen? I can say. Hmm. So now if people, uh, let's say if you are going to give an advice to a student who's thinking about doing an MBA or building a career in AI or do what you've done, like explored the world at the same time, achieved certain things like being a doctor and completing your thesis and now being a dean at a college. What advice would you give to the aspirant students? Well, if you want to follow a path like I did, I will advise you not to because uh, <laughs> though, though it was exciting and interesting, and you will go through a lot of uh, rocks in between and you will stumble upon a lot of stones especially coming from abroad. That is uh, what I can tell you. Interesting it was, I can assure you that, but not advisable, not to go out first, uh, unless you have someone supporting you mentally, like your family and so on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, yes, if you want to do any sort of tech background, definitely a liberal arts approach would be a must. 
the old fashioned BTEC, MTEC, or architecture or any sort of technical degrees as old fashioned procedures will not cut it anymore. You need an edge. And the edge happens to learning and understanding humans. And you just tell me what is left if we don't understand each other. We, what else do we have? We have nothing else. We are all in the same, in the same package at the end. We, we talk about countries, we talk about you know, success here and there, money. At the end of the day, we are all in the same planet. If you look from outside, we're just a mot of dust in the universe. We are nothing, we have each other. Instead of fighting with each other, which is what we mostly do all the time, uh, instead, just collaborate. And we need to stop being a, a ghetto. We, we're like a ghetto here, like conflicting for religion, for this, for that. Let's just start understanding each other. That happens through philosophy, psychology, sociology. So follow whatever path you feel appealed to, but at the same time, do not let alone that psychological or human side factor. And you can look at MLCs. Google, for example, is now hiring more philosophers than engineers because they have discovered and they have noticed that, hey, engineers are very good, but fine. But how, how do we, we think? How do we discover new concepts? Someone has to do that for us. So we need people who can actually go beyond that question mark and think laterally and outside the box. So that's what we require. And that's what everybody will require now. That is, I feel my most critical advice, which most people will not follow because they feel that they're not interested. And psychology, I, I can admit, it can become very boring at times with the theories and the experiments and so on. Science experiments are really not appealing, but uh, it's interesting to understand each other. I'm not talking to our counseling psychology, I'm talking just understanding and then applying it to your field. Hmm. You spoke about something which really sparked my interest, and I want to double click on that. You said if, you know, what you, like how you filled your part, you would not advise somebody to do that. So looking back, if let's say if I give you a time machine and say, Raul, you have a way to go back and relive your life, okay, and you have complete awareness of what, how you have lived, and you go back and relive it, what would that be? Would you become a footballer or would you, what would you do? <laughs> Yeah, well, football will be the most uh, <laughs> easy going <laughs> scenario, especially coming from Spain. But uh, I will, the problem is now knowing the outcome, I will change very few things. I don't have regrets, so to say, simply because if I will have regrets, I will be acknowledging that something I did in the past, I would like to remove it from there. I don't want to, because that led me somewhere else. So those, those mistakes, landed me into some other perspective. Like working in the industry initially might or might not have been my appeal or my focus, but that landed me into doing certain research and consequently landing into postgraduate education and then at the end, obviously, sending to academia. So everything, I feel everything that happens in life happens for a reason in the end of the day. So mm, I wouldn't advise people to go on the flow, but I will advise people to go intelligently. Think what you want to reach, but at the same time, do not lose focus on what is happening now. There is, there is nothing so, so called after or called later. It's something only called now and, and right now. Whatever you have, whatever you can do, do it now or don't do it. And that is why I don't believe about, okay, well, should I should have done this in the past, maybe if I have this regret. No point in doing that. It's just garbage in my brain. Instead of remove it, and, you know, keep moving on because there is no other option. Especially now that we are talking about this, I, I don't know if, well, since we are conducting today the podcast, uh, the Black Panther actor also passed away, yeah. uh, even with Kobe Bryant, which passed away a couple of a couple of months ago. I feel so. These are two personalities which I had a lot of respect for. No, Kobe Bryant for obvious reasons, uh, great player and great person. But the Black Panther actor as well. <clears throat> all these Marvel movies they have a very huge, huge psychological and philosophical factor to them, and yeah. he really represented that extensively. Uh, from the black community coming into into I know a dom white dominated the scenarios such as uh, the Marvel series, and he really fought for it as well because yeah. that doesn't happen overnight. That happens by fighting, and a lot of respect for this kind of personalities. Of course, everybody will have regrets at some point in time in their minds, but they never had it. I mean, they they were always moving forward. Like yes, whatever happened, it happened. Move on. There is no point. In, it's not. It's Keeping, keeping yourself stuck in the past. Why to do so? There's no point. And this kind of news is saddening and it makes you realize that there is no later, there is no after, there is only now. Uh, you never know what life will be like. Yeah. And that's why 
I also recommend that if you have something as a passion, do it. Don't think. Yes, yes, don't because think about cash, money, jobs, so because you will might not have the chance later yeah. of any sort. Yeah. No, uh, it, it is definitely a big uh, side saddening news about Chadwick Bosman, him passing away. Because to your point, he really changed the perspective of, uh, you know, and somewhere he sparked this uh, perspective of we are humans before we are color, right? And I think that's yes. something, I think uh, that's what he sparked. At least that's how I look at it more than anything else. Um, you know? And if you ever look at, I'm a big Marvel fan, and if you ever look at the Avengers Endgame, when he comes back, the entire cast come back. Yeah. And if you've ever been in a theater where the crowd is screaming, they, the amount of screaming they do when they see him versus somebody else is just phenomenal. It's just heartening and, to see that. And if you realize in that scene, he was the first one to come back with the two the two women along him. Yes. So that that factor that the the producers chose to bring him first. They could have brought any other character first, but they brought him first. Uh, that is given the edge. Of course, people might not realize this because they just look at the movie script. But there are a lot of things in those movies from every character, but especially from the Black Panther perspective, where everything is driven from a philosophical standpoint of yeah. commitment, of overachieving, not just saving humanity, but just the plot. There is something way beyond it. I feel Black Panther and um, beyond Iron Man con concept, I feel the Captain America kind of character really drove those two because Captain America is nothing but muscle. He doesn't have any money. He doesn't have any special abilities. Black Panther is, again, just trained, just like him. So these two characters really you know, gave an edge that somebody who is just as a normal guy can become something else by putting passion, putting effort, putting commitment to it. Yeah. No, on that note, on my favorite note of ending on Avengers and doing an Avengers Endgame kind of a reminiscence, I'm sure people will be able to visually see what we were talking. Thank you for your time, Dr. Raul. I think this has been really great conversation. Uh, and I hope uh, we stay in touch and I'm sure the listeners would learn a lot from today's conversation. Thank you so much and I hope we catch up again in the future. Thank you for listening in. And we close yet another episode of Masters Decoded. If you've enjoyed the episode, please, you can help us out by sharing it on social media. I would personally appreciate that. It's how we can reach more listeners, and the more listeners we have, the more awesome guests I can get in touch and convince to participate in these conversations. That are a joy to have for me, and I hope they are a joy for you to listen as well. You can also help a lot leaving reviews on iTunes or your podcast service of choice. Reviews are surprisingly helpful in supporting the podcast to get to more listeners. If this episode has intrigued you, I would request you to subscribe to the podcast to stay up to date and get notified to the future episodes. With that, I bid you and see you in the next episode.